Okay, now for what I'd really like to say, the ultimate punchline is what have we learned and what can we do better in the future? The good ways to teach evolution. First of all, I am very irritated by so-called defenders of evolution who don't know what they're talking about and continue to put their arguments in a veil of supernaturalism by using this, these terms like Mother Nature and the, the veiled teleological arguments. In other words, yes, there is a sort of final master plan for the world. Defenders of evolution are throwing this garbage in there and confusing the matter. I want to strangle those people. They will say things like, Mother Nature intended for this progressive increase in complexity and, and you see where we stand. Also, drawing of phylogenetic charts. This is another thing that uh, I should have put an example in here of this. Human beings, where are they on all the phylogenetic charts you've seen up until recently when somebody got smart? They're always on the right side. And the amoebas and things are over there on the left side. The, the, the unstated assumption of a kind of uh, progressive uh, chain of being built into these phylogenetic charts. Hey, let's mix it up a little bit. Let's put the humans in the center and the amoebas over here and the turtles over there. Hey, mix it up. Get people to stop and think of how these depictions of uh, present day diversity do reflect prejudices from the past. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, another thing that evolutionists will say, and this, hardly anybody would really say this, but I bet there are some out there who, who somebody says, well, is it true that we're descended from chimpanzees? Well, yes, it is true. And I want to get up there and say, no, it's not true. Or we're descended from uh, you know, rhesus monkeys or something. No, no, you idiots. We're all descended from common ancestors. Get that one straight for a change. Another thing that I think needs to be done is to present the complexity of evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory, did I put a thing in here? No, I didn't put a thing in here. Evolutionary, well, I thought I did. Oh yes, this is it. This is it, the very thing I thought I put in here, and here it is. Okay, there are many theories of evolution. There is the big theory that is, you know, speciation and uh, to some extent common descent and, and uh, um, um, breeding populations with changing gene frequencies and things like that. But for every single species there is out there, there's some nerds studying the phylogenetic tree that led to this species, be they amoebas or hominids or turtles or something else. And they're arguing like crazy with each other about the significance of this or that or the other uh, fossil. So for every species out there, for every paleontologist, you know that there are theories of the phylogenetic past. Thirdly, there are theories explaining the forces of evolution. In other words, natural selection, the biggie. But there's genetic drift out there, which is another theory to explain why there is changing gene frequencies within breeding populations. And finally, and this is an exciting new territory, theories explaining the sources of variation. I've seen things uh, produced for teachers. In fact, I got this stuff from the um, National Science Education Association, National Science Teachers Association, headquartered here in Arlington. Wonderful folks, but they produce teaching aids for teachers of evolution that are obsolete. And I'm so astounded, astounded by this. There's nothing that in there that I didn't learn in 1964 about the sources of variability, mutation, and gene flow. Hello, there's a lot of new stuff out there, including how retroviruses derail the DNA and, and, and this new epigenetic change. And whoa, talk about excitement. And, and where does mitochondria fit into to, to this? All these organelles and mutualism that's out there that are adding to vari variation that contribute to the forces of evolutionary change, namely natural selection and, and genetic drift. Get it right and, and make it complex and, and let people imagine the, the implications of these things for rapid change. That's exciting stuff. 
okay, finally, I think we should celebrate naturalism. Don't kind of go with our heads hanging down saying, you know, I'm so apologetic for my narrow-mindedness. But uh, supernatural explanations, we're just yeah, going to leave that out of our class. But of course, you're free to believe whatever you want to believe. But you know, I have my curriculum here, or I have my First Amendment. I have to obey this. Quit being apologetic about naturalism. Be thrilled that science is disciplined in this way, and that we don't allow this kind of haphazard way of, of, of including things that are basically an indication of extreme low standards into our curriculum. Be very, very proud and very upfront about a methodological naturalism that underlies scientific activities. Yay! In fact, if I were going to use an analogy, I'd say, here's the piano teacher. And the student who wants unfettered freedom comes in and says, well, I just want to bang on the keys for a while. Sorry. Or here's the French teacher, and the student comes in and says, I think I'd prefer Chinese grammar. No. And that's like science. Somebody comes in and says, I think I prefer um, talking about supernatural beings and Poseidon and everything. No. Um, I would like teachers to get their students. Here, I'm always thinking of sixth graders. I don't know why I keep thinking of sixth graders. But let's imagine your sixth grade class. I think they need um, a thought lesson which is contrasting supernaturalistic explanations with naturalistic explanations. Let's take something that's not emotionally loaded, like explaining why the um, tornado went through the community and flattened all the houses. Well, OK, a supernaturalistic explanation, and the class could be divided up into groups who can think of all the supernatural explanations. It might include, there were some homosexuals living in that house over there. Or, God didn't like the, how you were surfing the web and you found the child pornography. You, know, there. you, can, you can certainly come up with unlimited numbers of supernatural explanations for that phenomenon. There's no discipline at all. Talk about unfettered freedom. Yay, isn't that fun? But then the other half of the class is going to focus on the naturalistic explanations, which would include, hmm, well, let's learn a little bit about atmospheric pressure. Let's learn a little bit about humidity. Let's learn a little bit about cold fronts and warm fronts. And think about this. And let's learn a little bit about topography and why it's Kansas that keeps getting hammered by tornadoes. And you know, if you wanted to get back to the supernaturalistic explanations in Kansas, you'd have a, you'd have a field day there, too.